Hey everybody, welcome back to another fantastic edition of the His and Her Money Show, where we make it our business to help you take dominion over your money and your life. Thank you for tuning in. You could be tuned into a whole lot of shows, but the fact that you are here rocking with the His and Her Money Show makes us extremely grateful. And we want you to know that we appreciate the fact that you are here with us. You know that we love talking about money and getting out of debt and building wealth and how to steward all that God has given you well. And times we leak over into the faith area and we leak over into the, how do you live this life with intentionality, with purpose? How do you live this life with endurance? And we are going to hit that topic again today. We have a very special guest by the name of Daniel Fusco, who is in the wings waiting to share his heart with you. Some lessons that he's learned from his life through looking at the scriptures. And he's here to talk about his new book, You're Gonna Make It. Why is that important to us? I think we've all experienced some crazy things that we never saw coming over the last few years. And for a lot of us, it has thrown our life into a, a mess of sorts. And, and that's perfect because even the subtitle of this book is Unlocking Resilience when life is a mess. And you should know that the Bible has something to say about this messy middle that you may find yourself in and that there is hope. And so Daniel's going to help us all understand this a little bit better so that we don't just survive through life, but that we thrive through life. So let's get ready to receive. Get your pen and paper ready. Get your notes app open because there are plenty of jewels getting ready to come your way. Let's go get Daniel so we can dig on in. Hey, Daniel, welcome to the His and Her Money Show. Man, I'm so happy to be with you and everyone who's tuning in with us. We are excited that you're here. Um, you have been helping people out across the world for a better part of a decade plus now. And so we're excited that we get to uh, get some of your wisdom exclusively here on the His and Her Money Show for a little bit. But some people are being introduced to you for the very first time right here and right now. So for them, uh, would you mind saying hello and then kind of letting them know what you're all about? Yeah, so I'm just so excited to be with everybody here. So, uh, you know, as I said, my name is Daniel Fusco. I'm an author and I'm a pastor. I pastor a great church just outside of Portland, Oregon in uh, Vancouver, Washington. People all the time say, oh, I love Vancouver, BC. I'm like, yeah, I don't live there. I live in the Portland metro area, but I'm originally from New Jersey. So I'm, I'm a Jersey boy transplanted all the way across the country. And uh, for me, so much about what I am about and what I'm trying to do is I just really believe that uh, – we need to uh, walk with Jesus at street level. Like oftentimes we have a tendency, you know, I know everyone's on a different step of their faith journey. Uh, and it's oftentimes when people say, when things are good, God is blessing me. And when things aren't good, then God, you know, is obviously not blessing me. But really the Bible tells a different story that no matter if it's good or bad, God promises to be with us. And so, so much of what I'm trying to do is just help people kind of gain that biblical, that, that heavenly perspective that, you know, what, when things are going bad, we shouldn't divorce God from the bad things. Uh, God is with us and he's walking with us and, and changing us as we walk through things. And so it's kind of the passion of my life. And so whether I'm writing a book or I have a, a TV show that's on across the world called Real with Daniel Fusco or the radio or the podcast and, you know, the social media stuff, all, it's all kind of driven to the same end. How do I just help? I want to help people in a messy world uh, realize who Jesus is and, and really walk with them in the midst of it. If anybody has consumed your content like I have over the years, you are, at least from a distance, incredibly upbeat every time we see you and you're encouraging every time we see you. But this is a tough topic, man. You're, you, you went in the direction of how do we thrive in the midst of suffering? How did you end up here for this new book? You're going to make it. Well, in a lot of ways. I write books based on things that like I'm learning. So, you know, oftentimes people say, Hey, Daniel, you seem so positive and upbeat. Like, I'm not always like this. I mean, I have my moments like everyone else, but what I'm constantly learning is like when Jesus says things like I've come that they might have life and they might have life more abundantly. Like, I don't think he's lying. I think he's like, no, I really want to do something. And so then it becomes a question of, well, if Jesus wants us to have an abundant life, uh, life to the full, 
then how do we do that in a messy world? And it's not like our world is more messy than it was in Jesus's day. It's just messy in, in different ways. And so I'm constantly learning the things. And then I, I decided to write about it because it's like, hey, I want to learn this. So I, I'm not like an expert. I'm a practitioner. I'm like, I'm like the trial and error person who's like trying to figure out how does this stuff work. And so, you know, over the last number of years, with all that's gone on with, uh, you know, the pandemic and the social upheaval and the financial upheaval and all, I mean, we're all living in it. The number of times either I've said it to myself, someone has said it to me, someone in the church has talked to me, or fr a friend or a family member is like, I just don't know how we're going to make it. I don't know how we're going to make it. And, uh, I, and I was sitting in a meeting and it was kind of a rough meeting uh, for the church, Crossroads, where I get a pleasure being one of the pastors. Uh, and, and someone's just like, yeah, I don't know how we're going to make it. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know how we're going to make it. And I feel like the Lord's like, Daniel, you're going to make it like, why? Cause Jesus died and rose again. And so we're more than conquerors through Jesus. So actually my perspective is off. And so it, it kind of gave me a deep, gave me the, the passion to do a deep dive into what does it look like to be resilient when you can't stop life and try and catch up on resilience. Like I kind of felt like in the last couple of years, everyone was like, we need to be resilient, but we're in the middle of this and we don't really know how to get healthy. Like how do you get healthy in the middle of the race? Right. And so the, I, I went to the scriptures and said, okay, what is this all about? And how do we do this? And the Bible, as you said, has a ton to say about uh, resilience and perseverance and really how to get at this in a way that is life-giving. Yeah. yeah. I, I, Again, seeing you in the here and now is one thing, but uh, reading through your book, uh, what I didn't know prior to reading through your book was that as a freshman in college, you actually lost your mom. And that's a very real topic here. Uh, the, the people in the audience know that I usually have a co-host sitting next to me and my wife, but she is on indefinite leave because she lost her mom uh, a few months ago. And it just really completely and utterly has uh, turned her wor world upside down. Uh, tears very often, just questioning why. Um, I shared with you before the interview, we, we, we reached, recently launched a church of our own and her mom actually went into the hospital two days before our first service and never came out, never saw the church. And that's a question that my wife has before God, a mighty powerful pastor, prophet, and, and she just is like, why? You know, why, why would you, why would you have us take on this new assignment and not let my mom see it? And when you're, when you're in the throngs of it, right there in that pain, as you were, when you lost your mom, I think sometimes it's super easy to forget all the scriptures that you had memorized before it hit. Like you had all the scriptures ready in the pain, you know, this cloud comes and a, a word that sticks out in your subtitle is the world res, word resilience. How did you, how would you encourage others to pull, find resilience when the pain is so palatable, whatever they may be going through? Yeah. Well, first, I just want to say, I'm so sorry for your bride's loss, your loss, your family's loss. It's like, you know, it's something that I've ex I experienced. And so I, I know how painful it is. And, and I'll be praying for you guys. And, and, and there's no doubt that, you know, grieving is messy. You know, uh, and, and, and in writing the book, I really wish I could have said, hey, listen, you get this book, you're going to be stress free, suffering free, worry free, fear free, everything's going to be wonderful. But, but the Bible is much deeper than that. And the Bible actually invites us into a journey that is, uh, that is more challenging. Now, really what you're talking about is really walking by faith. Like I, I like to quote um, the, the greatest boxer of my generation, Iron Mike Tyson who used to say like, everyone's got a plan until you get punched in the mouth, you know? And, and as a guy from New Jersey, I'm like, Ooh, that, that means something. Right. And so, but what I realized is that like, everyone's got a plan for life until life comes up and, and, and just nails you. Like, like what your wife's going through, what I went through, what everyone's gone through in different ways, whether it's health stuff or financial stuff or, you know, inter, interpersonal things it's like life just happens to, to be that way. Now, what I like to remind people is that it's easy to walk by faith when everything is going well, but walking by faith when things are hard, it, it has everything to do with forcing our eyes off of our pain and off of the circumstances that are generating that pain and getting our eyes onto something even more certain, which is Jesus, you know? And, and so that is an act of faith. 
that is something that, you know, like I always tell people like as a pastor, like I believe in Jesus, but every single day it's, I have to decide to follow him and, and trust him and get my eyes off of the circumstances and onto him so that I can actually see life more clearly. So that raising our eyes off of our own hurt, which is very, very real and our circumstances that are not always welcome and putting our eyes onto our savior, that act of faith will change everything. It changes everything because then you start to realize, okay, I am hurting, but Jesus is a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Jesus conquered sin and death. So even like in the case of like, you know, the loss of a loved one in, in, in what we're talking about in our, our own personal experiences, you know, Jesus, when he died and rose again, he, he became intimately acquainted with death and conquering death through the resurrection. And so I know for me, when my mother passed away, I didn't know Jesus and I did not have any tools to deal with what I was experiencing. You know, as an all Italian kid, my mom was just the matriarch. She was the glue that held everything together. Larger than life person, just loved you hard and was just all for her family. And you just such an, I, like, I couldn't believe it. I'm never, she's never going to meet her grandkids, her daughter-in-laws and son-in-laws. And like, you know, all these things we're going to miss out on. Uh, but when I came to know Jesus, what I realized is that I can bring my messy grieving to Jesus and he is intimately acquainted with it because in God's economy, all death is wrong. He created us for life. Death is a, is a consequence of sin, not only our own sins, but the sin that has permeated all of creation, everything. And so anytime death happens, I'm reminded this was never God's plan. That's what my Bible tells me. Secondly, that God, even though it wasn't his plan, God has a redemptive plan within it. And then I can start looking at Lord, even though it was time to take my mom home, you know, Lord, help me to walk in a way forward with this as I'm grieving, as I'm hurting, as I'm suffering, as I don't understand it. Help me to walk forward in a way that really helps me to continue to become more like Jesus and blossom as a person. And I think that's the key when we realize that God's goal every single day is to make us a little bit more like Jesus. Then if we can grab hold of life and not push it away, we begin to realize that God also used suffering and pain and grieving as a way to make us more like him. Yeah, that's, that's true and tough. Something can be both. Um, something that jumped out in, in uh, reading through your book, you said that it's not just enough to have hope in Jesus in these moments, but there's a, a character development that has to go along with putting our hope in Jesus if we're going to thrive in the midst of messy situations in our life. Can you expound on that a little more? Yeah. So in the book, I, I, I break open what I call the resilience equation. And I really just took it right out of Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses one and two, where it says that if we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and is despising the shame and now is seated down at the right hand of God. And really what we have there is we have Jesus is an example of what I like to call hope plus grit equals unstoppable resilience. That hope for the joy that was set before Jesus, that grit, he was able to endure the cross and despise the shame. And then he lands at the end in what the Bible calls glorification, where he's seated down at the right hand of the Father. And, uh, and that's us it, it, joining him in victory. So really what goes on is that we need to hope. And that, that's a mindset that has our eye, and not just hoping and hoping, hoping in God, hoping in Jesus, hoping in the reality that God is the Alpha and the Omega. He, even though my future is uncertain, I know who is certain and that's the God of my future, right? And so we have that hope and we need that hopeful mindset because if you have the hopeful mindset, then if you stick in there, lean in, you know, the word I use is grit. It's a popular word, whether we're talking about John Wayne or Angela Duckworth wrote a great book on perseverance, but I define grit in the book in a biblical way, which is continuing to do the right things in the right way for the right reasons no matter the outcome. Because really what goes on is if you have, if you stay in there, but you either lose hope, then if you make it to the end, if you stick in there, when you get to the end, you're not joyful, you're not peaceful, you're jaded and cynical and hard-hearted, which isn't the abundant life. So you need the hope. But if you don't have the grit, then if you get there, then if you've cut a million corners and you haven't let God shape us into the 
the image of Jesus, conform us to the personality of Jesus, then we're not going to like the person we are when we get there. So really the idea is that as we go through things, and I think about, you guys, we're talking about his and her money, right? Like as someone is on the journey to alleviate debt, to be with, living in a budget, to, 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 to be able to invest and all these things, like there, there's a lot of ways to lose hope in the journey. Like, I'm just never going to get there. Right. But we all know you, you've done it. I've done it where it's like, you're just chipping away and it's a dream. And then all of a sudden it's a reality. And you're like, wow, you had to believe that that was possible to even start the journey, let alone stay on the journey. That's hope. But the thing is, is if you do that, so many people in trying to change their financial future, rather than doing the right things the right way for the right reasons, no matter the outcome, they start cutting corners cheating on your taxes, you, know, you do all these different things. And then you think he's going to get you there faster until you get audited. And then, it, it, you know, and then everything's backwards. And so the key is, is like, can we believe that God want, has a, a beautiful future for us? And can we step into it? And then can we keep doing the right things the right way? No, even if it, it's going to take longer. I remember when I was on this journey financially, you know, and I remember I had someone say to me, I can't believe you give to your church when you're trying to get out of debt. And I was like, oh, I'm like, explain to me what you're saying. They're like, well, if you need the money, you could take the money you give to the church and then you get, you know, and, and then you, and then you get out of debt faster. I'm like, well, hold on though. I'm like, it's not just about me getting out of debt. It's about me glorifying God, being a steward of my life, knowing that God has blessed me, that, that the work that I do, that's been God given the ability to hone skills. That's God given the passion to grow in those skills. That's God has given. So I, I need to honor the Lord in it because I know that if I honor the Lord in it, he sees what I'm trying to do and God will meet me in that, right? And so for me, those are like those examples where you're like, man, like I could have cut a corner, which for me would have been cutting a corner, like not living generously. And then, and the Lord was like, no, no, Daniel, I want to make you like me. And I want to show you that my ways are good. So trust me, it seems like it's going to take longer, but it's actually absolutely better. And so to me, that's like the, the, the equation. We need hope, but then we need to marry it to doing the right things in the right way for the right reason, no matter the outcome. Don't just start doing it right, but keep doing it right. And then when we get to the end of it, not only are we joyful, soft-hearted, you know, and, and we're full of faith, but we also get there and we've, been, we've allowed the journey to make us more like Jesus so that we look at ourselves and we're like, I'm so happy I'm not what I used to be. And I can't wait to see how God's going to change me more as I continue on this journey of life. Is there like any pre-work we can do? I, I, my mind went to like Genesis 41 and Joseph is interpreting Pharaoh's dream. and He says, well, this is what it means. It means that there's going to be seven years of feast and then there's going to be seven years of famine. So here's what you should do about this. You should take, you know, one fifth of everything during the feast era so that when the famine era comes, we'll still have food to eat. So maybe they're not in a place of messiness right now, but you talk about in the book, like if you're, you know, essentially if you're not in a storm, one's going to come at some point. So is there some pre-work we can do to store up, build ourselves up, develop our character to the place where when the storms of life hit, we have this reserve that we can tap into and maintain that grit that you're talking about. Yeah. So, and I love this question. So I like in the book, I talk about, we have to train before the race. So if things are going well, it's the best time to start to cultivate resilience. Now this can look a lot of different ways given the circumstances of our lives. So like you maintain resilience, like, so imagine you're working at a job and you don't really like your boss very much. But you know that you're supposed to be at that job. And so you showing up, trying to love that boss, honor that boss, and even sometimes say, hey, listen, can we talk about this? The way that you handle that, I, I, it felt very demeaning to me. You know, that's an act of growing in resilience. Because what most of us do, yet you have a boss who you don't necessarily prefer, and you kind of check, check out on them. Uh, you just kind of drag your feet. And so it's a simple way of doing it. One of the things that I do, I mean, obviously, I think growing in your faith every single day, that's a journey. So like, I like to be on a steady diet of the things of God, uh, not just like a, I'm in trouble and I need to kind of, you know, jump in the deep end with it. So reading your Bible every day, being a person of prayer, serving at a local church, you know, or serving at a local, uh, you know, um, soup kitchen or, or homeless shelter. And what I always tell people is that when we show up, God shows off. So not just showing up when it's 
when you want to, but making the commitment and continuing to show up, even when you don't want to, that is an act of resilience. Now, in the same way, choosing to work out uh, during the day, you're actually training yourself that you can accomplish things that are hard that you don't necessarily want to. But by doing it, I always tell, I, I work out with my 17 year old son, which is scary. First that I have a 17 year old and second to try and keep up with him because he's pretty spry and he's pretty strong and, and, he, and he gives his dad a run for his money all the time. But one of the things I always tell him, I'm like, bro, you realize that we're really working out our mentals as much as we're working out our body. I'm like, we're going to make it to the end of this workout and it's going to be hard and we're, but we're going to be happy we did it. And it'll probably be the hardest thing we do all day. Like what we're going to do over the next 20 minutes. And so that, again, that's a way that you train for the race in the same way, like with, we're talking finances, like being generous, going first with the first fruits, our generosity. It's easy to do it when financially we're strong, but I'm here to tell you when things are tight, like we're living in a time right now when we're recording this, there's inflation and there's all these things going on. But when you've trained the muscle when things are good, then when things get tight, it's actually not that hard to do because you're like, this is what I do. This is who I am. This is how I live. So taking the opportunities when things are good is so wise. Now, on the flip side of it, when things get bad, you things aren't going to stop so that you can find resilience. So it's, it is harder to kind of get going when you're in the middle of the mess. But in a lot of ways, that's where God does his best work, where you're like, man, I have to find resilience right now. That's kind of what we all learned over the last three years and why I wrote the book. It's like, all of a sudden we're in it and we're like, how is this going to work? And we had to find it while we're in the middle of it. And God is faithful when we come and say, God, you know, our Bibles tell us that uh, in our weakness, God's strength is made perfect. So when I catch myself and I'm like, I don't have the resources to do this, God, I don't know how I'm going to pull this off. That's really where God's like, yeah, it's about time you realize that. I remember when I first started reading the Bible, I kid you not, I, I always thought that, um, you know, God helps those who help themselves and God will never give you more than, than you can handle. I always thought that was in the Bible. And it's like, I was amazed when I read, I'm like, oh, that's not in there. Cause God, it doesn't say God will, won't give you more than you can handle. It actually says that God will never give you more than he can handle. And often he'll invite us into more than we can handle. So like when you hit that point, you're like, I can't do this. And then you come to the Lord who is all powerful, who's all knowing, who's all wise. And then you could say, oh, I'm way at the end of my resources, God. So can you step in and can you work in the midst of this? And when that happens, then all of a sudden you find reservoirs of resilience that you never knew you had, but it was in there because the spirit of God is in you and that God wants to empower us in the midst of the journey. Imagine a life where your money isn't strangled by mortgage payments. Imagine what you could do when you don't have to send them money that you work so hard for. Come get simple, powerful, and real solutions to eliminating monthly mortgage payments forever. America's number one money couple presents Crush My Mortgage. In this exclusive course, you will be equipped with strategies to help you move faster toward the promised land of owning your house free and clear. Learn strategies to help you in the areas of payment acceleration, extra income generation, and wealth creation, all to help you crush your mortgage. Visit crushmymortgage.com and get started today. Join us on the path to power, freedom, and legacy. That's crushmymortgage.com. Man, this is so good. And I can hear uh, in the audience this thought. Um, how do you handle knowing that, as you shared earlier, that God uses suffering to help us become more like Jesus. And that's a, on the spiritual side. In the natural, you're experiencing some type of pain. Uh, it could be a physical loss. It could be a relational loss. It could be a financial loss. And the thought that some people struggle with is, this is not fair. If you're stuck with, you know what, this isn't fair. How do you push forward? How have you encouraged others? How have you yourself pushed forward past that thought? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, again, these are some of the things when, when you get into it where you're like, man, there's, there's some depth to this. And, and it's simply this, that 
my belief that things aren't fair. Now I, I'm going to say this and I am from New Jersey. So I have a tendency to be a straight shooter, but I, I mean this with like, like I've walked through stuff. So I get it. My belief that it's unfair is actually a false assumption. It's actually entitlement to think that this is supposed to go a different way for me. Like, like because of who I am, because of how I think life should go, there shouldn't be hardships. You know, but Jesus said in John 16, 11, uh, 33, that in this world, you will have tribulation. I mean, think about it. If there was ever somebody who was entitled to have an easy go at life, it'd be Jesus of Nazareth, God in the flesh, the only person who never did anything wrong. And he was marginalized. He was aggressively persecuted. And ultimately, he was killed after he was completely publicly shamed and beaten. And you're like, if this is what Jesus gets, how, like what, what do I expect the world to be? And one thing that I talk about in the book is the fact that we really need, there's an old phrase that expectations ruin relationships. And one of the things that I realized is that, you know, we have a tendency, especially in this cultural moment, we expect that life is going to be easy, that everything's going to go the way we want it to go. And that kind of like the, uh, the old advertisement, I get to have my life my way. But really what it is, is that is an unrealistic expectation. It hasn't been agreed upon by God, by the universe. If you're like, well, I trust in the universe. The universe is not giving you your life's going to be the easiest thing in, in the world. And so what goes on is I think a lot of us have a false expectation of our own life, which is actually ruining the way we see life. And if you look at the biblical stories, and really if you just look at your own life and everyone you know, what you actually find is that nobody's life is perfect. No matter how much money, and people are always like, oh, so-and-so makes all this money and they're all miserable. How could, oh, you must be so good, easy to be miserable in a mansion. It's like, well, no, but they're still miserable. They still have all sorts of issues. So money doesn't fix it, right? Or excessive amounts of money. Fame doesn't fix it. Like, like we have all these things that we think, if I just get retirement, doesn't fix it, right? So what we realize, if you look at life, is that life is going to be hard. And if you really look at your own life, what I am learning is that I wish I didn't grow the most through the hardest things, but I totally do. Like, like on the sunny days, I never, I never walk away from the sunny. I mean, I may have enjoyed it a lot. Like when I'm on the mountaintop, I'm never like, man, I am growing so much. But when it's when I'm in the valley and things are hard and I don't know what's happening, when I come out the other side of that, I look back and I'm like, I mean, I wish I didn't have to go through that, but the fruit that God bore in my life my character, my perspective, my ability to be compassionate and kind and sensitive to other people, all of that is actually birthed in the crucible of suffering. So when I catch myself saying, this is not fair, I almost immediately take the step and I repent. That's the biblical word. I'm turning from my own way. I'm turning to God and saying, God, sorry for my ideas of entitlement. You never promised me that everything was going to work out the way that I wanted to. You never told me that if I believed in you, that everything was going to come up aces all the time. Everything was going to be up and to the right. You never told me that. I've assumed that. And that assumption is ruining my experience of life because it's keeping me from embracing what you are doing. Now, I know that that's, it's like, some of you say, well, that's evasive. It's like, no, it's like, I need to work on my perspective on how I see life so that I can actually see life as it really is and not kind of a fairy tale that I've dreamt up in my head. Damn. Thank you for that. Cause that's strong. We do. We think, and I, I, I know you said in your book as well, you said like, sometimes we pray prayers knowing that we're going to get that answer that we're praying. We're knowing we're going to get that job that we're praying for knowing we're going to get that the house that we're believing God for. And when it doesn't happen, I, you know, I even think, you know, in my own faith journey, uh, especially like early on when I was trying to grow in my faith and learning to have faith. And I remember I prayed for somebody with this new level of faith that I was mustering up and it, and it didn't come to pass. Like that person didn't get the healing that I was believing with them for. And it was a man. I was like, did I do it wrong? Did I not put enough faith behind it? Did I have a moment of doubt? Is that why it didn't? And it's just, uh, you know, sometimes we can get in our own head, but sometimes our enemy, the devil, can get in our own head as well. Um, any advice on recognition of when we're starting to trail off mentally in the wrong direction and we're starting to slip away from holding on to that grit? 
Yeah, I mean, the best advice I can have is, so, so I believe that so much of what God does in our life is he gives us his spirit and then he, his spirit convicts us. And so really to stay open to the conviction of the spirit in a lot of ways, like, you know, not to be overly theological or, 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 or you know, biblical, uh, you know, belief structure, but like the Bible teaches that we repent, we turn from our own way and we turn to God and we do it once for justification to be saved to be uh, forgiven and set free. But then every day really is a life of repentance where you're, you're, you're finding, but you're not being repenting unto salvation. You're repenting unto growth, sanctification or transformation. And so for me, when I catch myself not wanting to do the right things the right way, right as I realize that, now I may have been doing it for a while, I need to repent. I need to turn from the way that I'm going and say, God, you know, I'm cutting corners right now. Lord, you know, I'm doubting you right now. Lord, you know, I'm a little fearful. And, and, and there's that part of me, Lord, that you tell me it's, the Bible calls it my flesh. There's that part of me that actually wants to do it this way because it seems easier. But Lord, I don't want to. I want to do the right things in the right way for the right reasons because I, it's an act of worship. It, I'm, I want to steward my life well. And it's the same thing like with my, with my kids. I love my kids, but sometimes I'm like, I don't want to drive five kids, you know, three kids to five sports. Some days I'm like, I just wish that like, you guys would just not do sports, but I know like it's good for them and they're learning things and I'm proud of them. But there's those times when I'm like, I don't feel like going, you know? And then I'm like, Lord, forgive me. You Lord, you know, I'm tired, but Lord, I'm going to go and I'm going to support my kids I'm gonna support their team. And I'm going to drive them. And when they, when I drive, I'm not going to be like, well, I wouldn't have to drive so much if you guys didn't play so many sports, but I don't do that. But there's a part of me that wants to, because I'm broken like everybody else. So, but when I catch myself doing that, I just turn to Lord and say, Lord, change my heart. Now, one of the things I tell, I talk about this in the book, that the key for all of us, I believe, is to be obedient and then ask God to change your heart as you go. Because we live in a world that says, follow your heart. It's terrible advice. It's terrible. I always tell people, don't follow your heart. Follow Jesus and let Jesus lead your heart. And so when you know what the right thing to do is and you don't want to do it, you should do the right thing anyway and say, Lord, you know I don't want to do this. I really would rather do something else, but I'm going to do it because I know it's right. But Lord, will you bring my heart around? In some ways, we, you don't only think your way into a new way of acting. You act your way into a new way of thinking. And so I'm always saying, let's Can you say that one more time for the people in the back? Oh, yeah. So you don't only uh, think your way or act your way into a new way of thinking, or you don't only think your way into a new way of acting, but you also act your way into a new way of thinking. So, and it's amazing, like, and you read any of the science that's coming out now on transformation, it always begins with someone making a decision to think differently. Like, I remember I was, I was running. I don't like running, but again, I'm trying to keep up with my teenage son. So it's like, so I'm like trying to keep run and, and I'm, and I'm listening to this podcast and the person is like, you know, all the time people say, well, I'm not a runner unless I run a marathon. You know, and they're like, well, no, no, listen, only a very small percentage of people run a marathon. Like if you run, then you're a runner. And I was, and I was running and I was like, oh, I don't want to be a runner, but it's like, but you start, but you're running. And so in, in a lot of ways, we act our way into new ways of thinking. So I always say, choose obedience, choose to do the right thing, even when you don't want to and say, God, I'm going to do this because I know it's right. And then will you bring my heart around? And by choosing obedience, doing the right thing, even when you don't want to, and you ask God to change your heart, then as you're doing the right thing, again, that transformation is happening because he will change your heart. He will cause you to want to do the things that he wants for you that you don't want to do because we're lazy or tired or frustrated or we're like, I don't want to do this anymore. And if we can simply grab hold of that, really what happens is, is that, trans again, the transformation that we're hoping for, becoming the, the version of ourselves that God created us to be, a, a version of ourselves that we can look in the mirror and say, hey, I really like that I'm not the way I used to be. And I know there's a long way to go, but I'm moving in the right direction today. So let's, let's keep this train on that track. I, I'm wondering, as I'm listening to you talk, how much structure and routine play a part in helping you stay resilient? Because I know you're a pastor, and that has a litany of responsibilities all by itself. You're an author. You're always writing. Three kids and five sports, a wife. Uh, you're running. Like, how are you doing all this every 24 hours? And does a routine lead to that development of character? Does the routine lead to us acting our way into a new way of thinking? It absolutely does. So, you know, in a lot of ways, 
I try and put everything I can that I know is good for me on autopilot. So it's like, so, you know, and, and they, and again, the science of all this stuff is amazing. I love, I love the, love the science community. I don't always agree with some of the, some of the landing spots, but like they, they literally tell you that, you know, we have decision fatigue. That's why many of us, if we're trying to eat healthy by the, by if you're, if it's nine o'clock at night and you're sitting there and someone busts out, you know, some, some popsicles, we're going to eat it because we made a lot of decisions that day. So yes, I think when you know what the right thing to do is putting it on autopilot is the key. So things like, like, let me give you an example. Like, so when I wake up in the morning, I have a morning routine. I know I need to read my Bible first and foremost. So like I have a routine every morning, wake up, I stretch because I'm getting older, got to get the creaks out of the bones. So I don't, I'm not like hobbled all day. And then, and then I read my Bible. And as I drink my coffee, I read my Bible. I get some time in prayer. I know that happens. Then after that happens, we shuttle kids to school and then, or our youngest to school. And then I work out and it's like, and it's like, I do that you know, and then shower breakfast. And then before you know it, it's nine o'clock and it's time to start working, you know? And it's in the same way, like as you get to the evening time, having like, or, or with finances, I know that when, when it's payday, it's like, I, I give my, gen, I, I pay, give out my generosity. I, cut, I, I set up all my bills, boom, boom, goes into investments, all the places it goes, boom. And then it runs. And it's like, I put it on, I don't leave it to chance. I design it. You know, I think uh, James Clear, who wrote that great book called Atomic Habits, if people haven't read that, it's, it's, it's the best book on habits ever. He says, we don't have a habit problem. We have a system problem. And, he, and so his whole thing is you have to design the system so that you can have great habits within it. And as a Christian, I'm like, oh, that's even more powerful for me because I want my system to be the, the kingdom of God, the fragrance of Christ. And so I need to design the system to make sure that all these things that I care about I am prioritizing. I'm, I'm choosing what's the most important. And I know I need to get some di these different things done. So I do want to put it on autopilot. And, and, I, and I can only recommend that for everybody. Like whether we're talking about your finances, your own personal growth, the sooner you can put it on autopilot where you don't have to think about it. This is just what you do. You know, you just show up, you design it. And like every, what I do for what it's worth, because I have a busy life like everyone else, is that every about four months, my bride, Lynn and I, we sit down and we look at what we're doing and what we need to adjust given the different responsibilities we have, the different seasons and um, what we're learning as we're moving through it. Cause sometimes like, like we have kids. So the summer season is different from the fall season. You know, summer kids aren't in school. They might still be doing sports, but it's different. But then the fall hits and then you have kids in different schools and there's this and that and they're catching buses and, you know, and then they have after school activities and who's doing what, where. And then, so you have to adjust it to make sure that like for my bride and I, she's getting the things done that she needs to get done. I'm getting things that I'm done and I need to get done. What's happening with work, all these different things. So yeah, having structure and being intentional about making sure you do the best things you prioritize those things that help you. Uh, it, I can't recommend it more. How uh, you just brought up um, your bride. A lot of people listen to are married. A lot of people listen to are parents. How have you infused this into, you know, leading your family? Um, do you have these discussions? Do you find these teachable moments for your kids uh, to help them build up this unstoppable resilience? How have you communicated these thoughts and concepts with your wife? How can we not only go on this journey alone, but go on this journey collectively um, with our family? Yeah. So I, I think in families, making sure you're taking time to talk about things is essential. So like for my family, uh, we prioritize family dinners, you know? So it's like, you know, it's pretty much six out of seven nights every week, we sit down, me, my wife, our three kids, and we eat a meal together and we talk about things. And so, you know, like what's interesting is I had finished the book before it came out. The book was done. And then my, my son, who I did mention earlier, he had a skateboarding accident and he fractured his ankle, broke his leg. And, and it was, and it was like, it, it was a, we were not prepared for that, but very quickly I'm like, buddy, you know, I just wrote a book on this, you know? And, and we started talking about it and, and I said, listen, so, you, you know, you're going to be laid up for a while. So sports stop, working out stops. I'm like, but what, what are you going to do in this season? to not just lay around and be miserable and, you know, you know, watch TV. What do you want to do in this season? What do you want to accomplish? What would it look like for you to, to thrive, even though you're in a cast and you can't drive your car and all this stuff. And he's like, you know what, dad, I really prayed about it. 
And I really, I really want to learn how to do uh, computer programming and coding. I'm like, great. How do you want to get at that? And he's like, well, I was thinking about it. And, and he ended up playing. So what's amazing now, you fast forward, this was 10 months ago. And my son is legitimately a good programmer because he took the time. He was laid up. He was like watching videos on YouTube. He started doing projects, you know, and it's like he, he rather than just mailing in that time, he's like, this is an opportunity to learn something. And so now he's like, he's, you know, and he's getting ready for college. He's going to go for computer programming and he's, you know, he, he works with different programmers and it's amazing what he's done, but it, it is like, it, it's an example of how this stuff works. If you're willing to say, I'm not going to waste the hard things. I'm going to grow, even though I wish this wasn't here, I'm going to grow. And so I'm going to take this step of faith. And so, and, and of course with my, my, my wife and I, whether we're talking through our life or our finances, we're always talking about these things and, and she's a great, you know, I'm not the teacher and she's the student. It's like, we're, we're all teachers and students. We all learn in things. Like I watch my son and I'm like, he's teaching me these things that I'm talking about. He's showing me the, the proof of these things. Cause I'm watching it in his life or I'm watching, I watch my middle child. She never played volleyball before. And she entered high school. She's like, I'm going to go out for the volleyball team. And I was like, okay. And she ended up making the JV volleyball team. She hadn't played volleyball. But it's like now it's like she's one of the starting six and she's out in the backyard practicing and she's tired and she's like taping up her wrist and she's like out there. And I'm like, oh, don't hit the ball against the windows of the house, sweetie. But I'm like, just keep hitting that ball. And, and so all of that, like I'm watching these things and I'm like, oh, this is this is resilience at work. This is what it looks like to to, to lean into life and be intentional about life so that we can experience all that God has for us. If, if you could help people walk away from this book with a concept that you just want to make sure that they don't miss, what would that be? Well, I would say the one concept that I don't want anyone to miss is that hope has a name and his name is Jesus. And everything about life for me is it's all of life is the curriculum to learn who God is how he works and how he wants us to work. And every situation is an invitation from Jesus where Jesus is saying, I want you to come to me and let me show you how I want to work through this. And if we remember that, then life becomes this beautiful adventure and it's not all easy. And sometimes it's just really hard and heartbreaking, but God is still working. And so if, because your life is an invitation from Jesus, the circumstances are the curriculum to teach us certain things, just keep showing up, saying yes to Jesus. And I promise, I know it sounds almost, it's like, it's almost impossible, but you know, with people it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. You, you'll look back on the stuff and you'll be like, even though that was hard, I'm so happy for the lessons that I learned. And so Jesus gives us that. And I think that that is very, it really makes life, what Jesus called abundant, beautiful, uh, gorgeous, you know, all, all these things. And, and I really believe that it's, it's awaiting all of us. If we would simply trust Jesus, turn to him. And when, G when circumstances are crazy, it's an invitation from Jesus to come to him and let him do his work. So I just want to encourage everyone, just keep saying yes to Jesus. Amen. Amen. The name of the book is you're going to make it. Uh, Daniel, if people want to keep up with you um, on social media, uh, with all the things you got going on, your church, like where do they find you? Yeah. So um, if they just put my name in any, you know, if whatever platform it is, we have content pretty much everywhere. Uh, all the different platforms. I just put my name, Daniel Fusco in there uh, and you, you'll find me on there. And I'd love to connect and hear your story and, and, and join me on the journey. Well, we have a link to the book in the show notes of this episode. Please go pick up Daniel's new book. You're going to make it. It is full of wisdom that we all need in this very season. Again, we got it linked in the show notes. So go ahead, click the link, and get your copy today. Daniel, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule, three kids and five sports, and making time for us and sharing this wisdom with us today. Uh, I appreciate it so much. Thanks for having me. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Another fantastic edition of the His and Her Money Show is in the books. You have some work to do. First thing you need to do is get Daniel's new book. You're going to make it because it is full of not just inspiration, but it gives you a lot of practical things that you can apply to your life ASAP. This is content that you need 
inside your personal tool belt. So make sure you go get a copy today. And remember, we've got a ton of episodes and inspiration just like this over at our website, hisandhermoney.com. That's all we got for this time, guys. It's been great. Till next time. Peace.